Welcome to Whole Team Eats Podcast, a 24-8 media production. Ever wonder who trains your favorite athlete? Join Tim Miller as he takes a look at the behind the scenes training of professional and collegiate athletes. Tim connects with trainers, athletes, and others in the sports community to share their stories. This podcast is dedicated to highlighting the work of athletes and trainers to inspire action and build community. What's up, everyone? Welcome to an all new episode of Whole Team Eats Podcast. This is episode 10, season one. I'm your host, Tim Miller, and on the show, I sit down with Troy Jones of House of Athlete. Troy's passion for training started from his roots, coming from a family of educators, constantly trying to understand the why behind things and challenging the status quo is what allowed Troy to stand out within the training industry. His detailed and structured approach to training created a natural audience who are engaged to learn and better understand his training principles. On the show, we discuss Troy's love to inspire people. Growing up, Troy witnessed several athletes fall through the cracks without proper training and made it his mission to help change that. His training business started on a football field with a makeshift weightlifting belt for resisted speed training. Out of his first 50 athletes, 30 went pro in some capacity. Troy also describes his 10-year rule and how he does a minimum of one hour of research per day. It is my pleasure to introduce Troy Jones of House of Athlete. Troy, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, So, Troy, I know we were talking before the show, but I think a good place to start off is just to ask, how has been training to start 2022? I know you had a lot of different... Uh, you know, combine training and off-season training and house athlete. Could you tell us a little bit about how training's been to start the year? Training was great. Um, we started out the year. We had 22 athletes for combine. Um, we had draft picks up and down the board. Uh, guys ran really well, performed really well, jump ran, jumped really well. Uh, strength numbers were good. Uh, I would say all of our guys are in camps right now that were drafted, a few went undrafted, but they got picked right up in the camp. So, and they've been perform, performing well. In our OTAs or our pre-OTA training with our pros, we were good. We had a good number of athletes coming through. And then our summer training program was really, really well. Uh, we were consistently around 26, 25, 26 guys throughout that four week process. And, um, people are performing well in camp. The big thing is they're going in healthy and they're going in feeling ready to perform like they were prepared. So mentally and physically, they were in good places. And that's kind of what we like to check the box on, sending those guys into camp. And are most of those guys, like, earlier in their career or are they more veteran-type players? We get a good balance. Me being around as long as I have, I get a good mix of veteran players so um, and young players. But being able to keep – understanding the right amount of volume and creating a perfect program to get veteran players to address – pre-existing injuries, uh, things that become chronic have to work around from years and years of playing is one of the reasons why they like to kind of train with us here at HOA because we holistically blend our medical and our performance training. We try to integrate it together to make that and keep us in conversation with our medical team to make sure these athletes are feeling good. So that's why I have a thing that I like to say, if you move well as a human being, you move well as an athlete before you can move well as a football player or whatever sport that you participate in. So we actually really organically start that process of making sure everything's working properly, then progress them into the training aspect. And by the time their bodies are feeling good and moving well, they're ready to start playing football. And that's pretty much how we approach it. And because of that way, because of that approach, we get a lot of veterans that to come down. I think what we want to do is we want to take a deeper dive into the off season and house the athlete and, and your role within house the athlete in a second. But um, if we could, to get started, I want to talk about your background, you know, uh, you know, growing up playing sports, maybe. And then how did you eventually find your passion for training and, and how did you actually come into the training business? I always like to say <laughs> training chose me more than I chose training. And um, or I would say my steps are or God had a purpose for me. Um, I come from a family of educators. I love to play. I was a good athlete coming up, played sports, uh, played some indiv- independent baseball, played some, got to a decent level of playing, um, just couldn't seem to get that breakthrough moment. 
I was like, you know, I got married early, so I ended up having a family early. And I'm having responsibilities kick in early. I had to make a choice, too. So in the process of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my career and then having that coming from that background of educators in my family who had a knack of teaching, I kind of fell into it. Because when I would be in my training sessions preparing myself, I would look up and I would have an audience. And in school, you know, I've always been real from a standpoint of I like to know the why behind things from a scientific standpoint. So that's been in me as a, from a child all the way up to the point to a young adult. So in my training, when I was working on myself and preparing myself, I would always be real detailed in my approach and structured and organized on how I would set things up, which would create an audience. And people would ask, why would you do that? Why did you do this? And why did you do that? So because of that audience, and I started working with, I find myself working with other athletes and showing them what to do and how to do it. And was like, hey, shoot, this is interesting. I This can actually be something, something that I might can do for a living. But that wasn't the case. It was more about the love for understanding everything. It was about making me come, become a better, pace, better player, a better athlete, or what I wanted to participate in. And it just grew from there. So you have this passion for training, and that's always first and foremost. And But it's really evolved into – passion for training first, business second. And the business comes natural just because of, you know, your persona and the way that you were raised in a family of educators. But what is it that kind of stood out to you about training at the beginning that 28 years later has has really brought you in and, and kept you in, in, into training? Is it working with the athletes? Is it motivating them? Like, what is it that makes you want to come back each and every day? I love to inspire people. I love people day in and day out, always have. Um, I look for the good in everyone, but as big as trying to help people be successful with what their goals are. And um, I've always felt like that I was undercoached. I never really got the coaching to the level that I felt like was up to the standard to help an athlete maximize their potential. And there was so many athletes that fall through the cracks because they weren't taught correctly or they were written off. It's one thing I used to hate when coaches would label players as, oh, he's an effort guy. Let's use that as an example. You know, what does that really mean, he's an effort guy? Are you saying because he lacks one skill set, you're just going to label him as a guy because he has a motor or he has intensity? Or saying, okay, is this guy using intensity to cover up some type of shortcoming within his ability to play that sport? Let's kind of try to identify what's causing him, what the issues are, with what he's lacking. Don't just say he lacks this aspect. He lacks this aspect of the game. Let's focus on what's causing him not to be able to change direction well or have short area bursts or any aspect, his ability to jump vertically if he's a basketball player. Why? Let's find out why and then create some type of uh, script to help solve that puzzle. Because I always feel like you're limitless in your approach if you have the right prescription set for you to help you get better. Everybody has room to improve. And then also, what are those strategies that you can use to help offset some of the things that you lack? Because there are, it's not many guys that, there's an old school saying that we used to use in baseball, baseball players back in the day, it was called five tools. So you have five tool player. Guy might have four of the tools or three of the tools the other tools he were lacking. Okay, how can we actually show that athlete where we can be average in those other two tools and him focus on those three tools but still play at a high level if we give him the prescription to be able to achieve that or to approach it that way? I felt like there just wasn't enough time that would be taken to help that athlete develop because of the business side of the sport. And I just think athletes were falling through the cracks because of it. That's interesting. Of the trainers that we've had here on, on, on the show, there seems to be a common theme where several trainers, they come into the business, but really it's it's deep rooted to their, the, their start of training where they didn't believe that themselves or other athletes around them got the proper training that they deserved. Mm-hmm. Um, and they saw a lot of different athletes, as, as you kind of said, fall through the cracks. So it's interesting to hear as multiple trainers have kind of all shifted and you, you, you as well talk about 
the under, I guess, service of trainers at a certain point in time. And, and we're starting to see more and more trainers coming to the forefront, helping athletes of all different ages. We've got, you're dealing with collegiate and professional athletes and, and, and maybe more than that even. But a lot of folks are now telling us that there's a lot of different athletes that don't get that type of training that they need to be successful early in their careers or even to able to get that opportunity to take it to the next level. Yeah. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you, so you started your business 28 years ago in the training business. Where did you actually start out? I actually started out on a football field <laughs> uh, with uh, rubber tubing that had no covering to protect it from breaking that I had tied a knot into a leather weightlifting belt and stuck it in and tied a knot on the back end. And then on the other end, I had another weightlifting belt and I tied a knot in there and poked a hole in it. And that's how we did our resistant running <laughs> on a football field. And here we are today. You know, that's kind of how it all began. But um, from the standpoint, when I went out on my own, but it all kind of started when I, I was working in a company in Baltimore that was the Merritt Athletic Club and um, started getting into the business side of wanting to do it just from me training there. My first few pro athletes that I started training all the way back then um, in the early 90s was Jim Poole, who was a left-handed pitcher. Um, Bam Mars was a running back for the uh, Steelers back in those days, different teams. Uh, some of those were my first pro athletes. Again, just being around them and seeing what I was doing and just having, having interest just because of the detail and the things were set up. And when it, I left, Merida, left the Merritt Athletic Club and went out and started on my own, I had started building up a following of a lot of youth athletes. And my first 50 youth athletes, out of that first 50, 30 of them went professional in some capacity. And that's how I kind of began with me, trying to figure out the formula of how, and how can I create an adaptation with young athletes to make sure I put the proper – script or the right amount of volume that their bodies can actually adapt to what the stimulus is to benefit from it and not overload them with too much. Because a lot of times you, we were back then in those days, people were mimicking what they saw. So it really didn't have an understanding that this kid can actually handle what they saw this high, this youth athlete can handle what they saw that high school athlete doing or versus what they saw that pro athlete doing. They just felt like, okay, I'm going to do the same thing I saw this guy doing because he's good and it's, it's going to transition over to me. And it wasn't that way. And when I kind of started finding out the right script for youth athletes and how to develop them and then understanding that pre-puberty, creating the right environment internally with them, pre-puberty creates an adaptation post-puberty that transfer or translates over to the sport that they participate in. It began to build and grow and grow. And you see all these athletes start coming out of what I call TZ Sports. That was the name of my company back then. And we start having just layers and layers of athletes coming through of everything, baseball, basketball, football, soccer, lacrosse, figure skating, swimming. We were just putting out tons and tons of athletes because we just created this system of how to take the youth athlete. And now there's tons of science on how it works now. But they're taking that youth athlete and understanding where they are at that stage of their development and actually having the right amount of doses to help them develop the transfer or to trans or to graduate to the next system and to the next system to get them all the way up the all the way up the scope to when they can perform at the highest level they want to. So it was kind of I stumbled into it. Then I understood the science behind it through research and study, and then I began to build out a program, and it just grew from there. So thirty out of fifty athletes doesn't seem like coincidence, right? It seems like there's something that you were doing that helped propel these athletes to the next level. But that's, that's, a, that's a crazy number of 30 out of 50 athletes to go professional in, in some sport. But what is it about, like, is it training youth athletes pre-puberty or what did you do to have a, that profound of an impact on those kids at such a young age to help them take their Game to the next level. I'm trying to keep it simple. I don't want to go really strictly deep into science. But the one thing I, I more so began to understand of what that need of that athlete was at that stage of his development. Meeting an athlete where they are at that current stage 
and not trying to force feed something into them that they just weren't able to use at that moment. An example, I would watch coaches on the field and they would ask a football field. And let's use that as an example. And I would say, coach, you'd be like, you need to get deeper in your squat. Okay. Get lower. So the first thing a kid does when he wants to get lower, doesn't squat, he bends over or he drops to the cert. He drops to a certain level so that he's able to do at that time from a standpoint of squatting and holding the right position. But then they'll say, that's not low enough. You need to get lower. So now he's going to compensate that movement or try to try to try to to or try to answer what the coach is asking him to do. And he's going to try to go lower. Now, so now he's going to actually go into some kind of dysfunctional movement pattern and begin to bend over at the waist. And now he's not in a position of stability to even create any type of force or leverage that the coach is really trying to get him in that position to be, be to be in to begin with. So getting un- coaches to understand that this kid is giving you what he had. He's giving you everything that he has. So how do we build strength from that level to get him to the levels to where he needs to be? And just the progression of exercise selection begin to change from a step-by-step approach to create stability and strength for that athlete where he's at at that current point was the beginning of how I started layering it out. So I noticed that isometric strength was a big deal for me. One of the um, first things I read a long time ago, I'm a big martial arts guy. So I was into Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee, was being an isometric, so there's some books on him back in the day. And I also studied a lot about gymnastics and how they built strength with gymnastics athletes, youth. And I started wondering, okay, if I could take some of the properties and principles from youth athletes and gymnastics, who you know, some of the most explosive athletes in the world at very young ages, and start adapting them to youth athletes across the board, I need the explosiveness that those athletes can generate and then as they're learning the skill set, if I have this foundation of explosiveness, I already begin to establish basically utilizing isometrics to get into the right positions to create stability and to learn how to utilize the ground to transfer forces, I can build it out from there. It was something I stumbled in, and then I systematically created it to progress it. And then it was funny because then Cal Dietz jumped out with triphasic training and came out about the different phases of training and I had already been experimenting with it. And then he kind of just reinforced my thought process with all the science and everything behind it, which was like great for me. Cause it was like, I knew I was onto something, but my proof within the athletes that I was already putting out, but the big story behind it, the gymnasts and young gym, young gymnastics really began to show me what I can do with my younger athletes. And so I created a safe environment to actually get them to where they need to be and to build those layers of strength where they can produce those forces through the ground or get into those positions that's relatively necessary. So I also looked at the lack of body control, which I attributed to core strength and stability and being able to transfer forces through their trunk and their torso. So using exercises that begin to incorporate trunk stability and motor control of their limbs with the, and controlling that environment for them it just began to take off. I am hope I'm being simple to try to keep the thing as simple as I can, but it just began to take off because then once they understood if I control my trunk and my torso, then controlling my arms and legs around that was relatively easy. It's, it's inter- interesting to hear how some of your early kind of, you know, testing out different things with training is then backed up and validated by other you know, science and, and things coming out at that point in time in the industry. But everything that you just talked about comes back to one core thing that you mentioned at the beginning of the show was, you know, your passion for people. And this is a per- people business and getting to understand these athletes on an individual level. And if one athlete can't do a certain squat or a certain exercise that they're being told to do, it's not because they don't want to do it. It's just that they're limited at that point in time as an athlete. So it's, it's important for you, what it sounds like as a trainer to individual, like to reach out to these folks as on an individual level, tailor the lifting or the exercise to their specific needs at that specific time. And really what it comes back to is a people business, understanding these athletes and understanding how to get the best out of them. And that every athlete's not created yeah. equal. Um, I wanted to also ask you, um, so you're in now 28 years in, in the business. What has that evolution looked like from a training aspect from, 
like, could you just walk our listeners through, I'm sure there's a bunch of ups and downs. Could you walk our listeners through that evolution of where you started and, and now where you are today for those folks who don't know who a house athlete is? Uh, well, I'll tell you, it, it's definitely a lot of ups and downs to the story. Um, I started, like I said, with a company called Merritt Athletic Club and worked my way up through that company. Um, and at the time, I still wasn't sure is this what I wanted to do. And um, because, <clears throat> again, I was also thinking about something about I had to think about how I could take care of my family as well. I knew I didn't want to sit behind the desk. I tried that. didn't work. Uh, I wanted to play. That wasn't working. So I needed to figure out a way of how can I still stay in sports and earn a living. And the training began to come to life. So at the end of research and study, one of the things I, I, I prayed about it, I, and I'm a man of faith. And, uh, you know, I told God, I said, if you can expose me to what I need to become one of the, the top trainers, not necessarily trainers, or give me the information that I need to help some of these athletes become some of the best athletes in their lives or best athletes on the planet so they can accomplish their goals. What do I need to do to uh, attain the knowledge necessary to be able to accomplish that? And one of the things that I felt in my heart that he told, you know, because I'm, you know, I, like I said, I'm a very spiritual guy. He just came to me spirit today after about a day or two of just concentrating on it. It was like 10 years. That number stuck in my head for a long time. It's like 10 years. It's like 10 years. It's going to take you 10 years to get a full understanding of what you're doing. So I was like, <laughs> All right, I'm willing to do it. Let me, all right, I'm willing to do it. So I dove deep into everything that I can research for oh, every day for a year. I mean, I mean, over years and years and years. And to this day, I still do it 20 plus years later. 28 plus years or 20 plus years later, I'm still doing the exact same thing. Minimum an hour a day of research. Minimum to stay ahead of the curve, to try to find the easiest way to accomplish the goal, which is through communication. So being able to explain it to the athlete so they have a full understanding of the concept you're trying to teach them so they actually can get to that, so they actually can actually, I would say the word, I would say they can demonstrate or they have an understanding when they become self-aware. Um, how can I streamline that communication and understand what the principles of what training is all about? Because that's why now to this point, I'm a principle-based trainer. I care nothing about the methods. I mean, Principles are based on physics. Methods are just the tools that I use to get there. And I have a saying that I say all the time. I say methods are many, principles are few. Methods change, principles never do. Um, and it's a statement I just modified off of another, young, uh, another gentleman that, that kind of made that quote all the years and years ago. But the method doesn't matter for me. It's the progression, and it's based on the principles on how I approach it. Communication is key in every line of work, but it, it seems to be even more of a key in, in, in training because you could be the best trainer in the world with all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't communicate that knowledge to the athlete, it's not going to translate. Like there's a lot of time like, and you spend a lot of time with your athletes, but there's also a good amount of time throughout the year where they have to be able to understand how to take care of their own bodies without your guidance and they have to understand what they're doing and understanding what they're doing to, to understand how it translates to make them a better athlete or how to how to you know recover from an injury whatever it is they're working on in that you know progression it's extremely important that they understand what you're trying like what the end goal is with whatever you're working on um, i did want to take a step back and ask you so you, you said you you trained athletes of almost every sport right uh, is there one sport in particular that's harder to train for than another, or are they all kind of the same with the same type of, uh, you know, research going into them and the way you train athletes? Is it, is it somewhat similar, or is there one in particular that might be more I think, difficult? I think that's a great question. I think athletic movement across the board is one and the same. You only can move lateral. You only can run linear. You only can go vertical jumps. And everything's movement from a standpoint of a base is the same thing From if you want to peel back the layers. What happens is the stimulus or the, the rules of the sport begin to govern the type of movements that you utilize to be successful. Um, so your program has essentially needs to be built around being an athlete, which will power the skill set aspect of the sport itself. If you stay disciplined in that, that's when you see the most benefit. Because a lot of times we live in a society now where it's heavy skill set development. Um, and it, and and it's slowed down and gotten away from development as an athlete. And because of that, some of our sports, the way the sports are played, has changed. 
Um, we go from a time, let's go back to baseball. Ricky Henderson stole 100 bases in a year. Now, what are the most bases? What is the largest amount? What the biggest amount of bases being stole, stolen in a year? That means is there a lack of speed or people just aren't interested in any developing linear speed uh, or acceleration from that aspect is really what's the key to stealing a base. Phys- in the NBA, physicality of how people play is more about developing the skill off the dribble in the open floor than it is about owning the post and being able to be strong in your base where basketball players may not have the same interest in building strength like they did years ago. Is that evolution of the game or is that just lack of athletic development? Because I feel like you can have, I feel like there's limitations in your skill development after a period of time. Um, And if your body, let's look at a bottle. Let's look at this bottle, for example, this bottle, Right here is the actual frame of the athlete, and the water in the bottle is this development of skill set. Okay, once you get to a certain point, you can't force any more water into the bottle. So, how do you improve the athlete's ability to get better? You have to increase the size of the bottle so you can add more room to actually develop more skill set. And I think what happens is we flipped it, we stopped developing our bodies and focusing more on skill. So then then you get to a certain point where you limit your ceiling. So you can take an athlete who has great ability from a skill standpoint, and they come in and then we exploit all these dysfunctions within their body up and down the chain and then show them a prescription of how they can improve just on physically getting better and moving more efficiently as an athlete powers that skill set. It's interesting. Um, kind of changing the way that a lot of athletes think, right? It's just, I can just work on my skills and become better in my respective sport, but it's really working on refining that athlete as an athlete first, and then building on that skill set second. Um, I wanted to now fast forward to House of Athletes. So if you could just tell our listeners a little bit more House of Athlete about how you came into House of Athletes. So I think we were talking before the show is roughly five years ago. And you were approached by Brandon Marshall, former NFL wide receiver. Uh, how, how did you guys get connected, and, and how did he understand that you may have some interest in in coming to House of Athlete? Brandon, like I said, Brandon is a visionary. He has ideas, uh, and he has, and he knows exactly what he wants. His intent is really, he has an intent and a purpose behind how he moves. And he, at the time, he was looking to find someone like must find someone who can bring the level of training as how he envisioned it into his company and be able, because he was still playing at the time, and begin to lay down the ground rules or lay down the methodologies, methodologies behind it because he's seeing where the future was going. So he was trying to adapt to the future of our industry and finding the right people that he can plug in to keep taking fit speed at the time in the right direction. Um, and that's through just finding through the process of trying to find the right person to do that or begin that process. He found me and then he began to research and watch cause he doesn't do anything just off the cuff either. He will research. So he researched and watched before he even reached out. And then he finally reached out and we began to have dialogue. And then over that course of the dialogue, we actually started seeing that our visions began to match up. So, in coming to Florida, at first I wasn't going to come. You know, I, I came down to visit. I wasn't sure, but I, I, it was something about his vision in regards to how he wanted to approach the industry that matched up with mine that it caught me in the right place at the right time. Because I had a company that was called TZ Sports, and TZ Sports was a, I had built that company up to a twenty-one thousand square foot facility. I had whole court basketball court in there. I had turf thirty by forty yards. I had, Olympic lifting platforms. It was a full facility and I was operating well and it was growing. What happened was Walmart came in and bought the shopping center that I had built it out of and found loopholes in the lease. And when they found loopholes in everyone's leases, so we're talking about anchor stores like Kmart, uh, shopping, big shopping stores, uh, that they pulled all these leases to tear that building down. And they did that, which caught me in a situation where I had to take everything. I mean, I had 10,000 pounds of rubber and pallets that we would drop in the turf that I had to put in storage, had to put all the stuff in the storage. And that kind of the timing of when 
Brandon came along and, and, and looking for someone to come down to House of Athlete, all that had just transpired in my uh, career in my, with my facility. So it was the right timing. But I still didn't need to because I still had my all my athletes that I was still training. And I was speaking about youth development because a lot of people had questions about how I developed all these youth athletes over time. All these guys that went from high, from elementary school to pro that came through our system. And um, <clears throat> I came out to visit and I was like, let's just fit the model that I'm looking for. His vision does match up. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I, I was going to pretty much say no. And then, I, you know, like I said, I'm a man of faith. I prayed and go up and say, no, I need you down here. So um, I'm like, are you serious? Is this is what you want me to do? All right. I'm obedient. So I listen. And, and I'm glad I did because I felt like our relationship, me and his relationship, has grown tremendously in a good way. Um, I think the direction of House of Athlete is, is, on, has only one direction to, to go is but up and it's trending in the right direction. And then what we're trying to, what we're trying to stand for within the industry is different. We want to educate people within the industry in the process of how to train the right way, whether it's adult population, whether it's youth population, whether it's professional athletes. We want to educate the industry on the right way to do things. And everything's the right way to do things to where you can actually maintain it for throughout the duration of your career as a young, as a young athlete getting started, as a pro athlete approaching retirement, as a pro athlete just getting started, whatever stage of your career in you're in, we have an answer and a progression to show you how to train within it so you have longevity. That's the message that we're trying to get across. There's a right way to do things. And we just want to help people along the way and give them access to that information. Otherwise, is saturated in an industry because there's too much information out there right now. Absolutely. It's uh, an overload of information. And unless you're in the right spot being mentored like somebody like yourself, it's very difficult to find out what information you actually need to apply versus there's, you know, there are a lot of different training methods out there that may not be applicable to certain athletes. Um, so your title, you are the director of performance science and education. Correct. Is that correct? It seems it seems fitting that you have education in your title from your your background mm -hmm. and your family. Um, you, you've always loved being an educator, but can you just talk about like what your daily role looks like at House of Athlete for those who don't know what you do on a daily My basis? My role is dual because I not only am I a director of performance science and education here, I am also director of performance here which means I run all performers from professionals to youth athletes in Western Florida. And my director of performance science educa and education title is for House of Athlete as a whole standpoint to make sure or to, to create all the methodologies that our company utilizes in training its athletes within the performance division. Um, <clears throat> my day to day right now I'm coming off the NFL off season was to train the pros in the morning from a movement standpoint and a strength standpoint and do all the program design for them. Um, from our football to our NBA that we have in, we're finishing up NBA, some NBA players right now, currently uh, NFL is gone, NHL, uh, MLB, you know, I, there's a lot of different moving parts. So I would say training NFL guys was just finishing up that training NBA guys currently traveling for MLB guys to support them to make sure their bodies stay up to par. Um, I call it neural priming. We try to keep their bodies intact from all the different aspects of the training that we accomplished in the off season. So we're trying to slow that process down of them losing it basically more than anything else, just from the volume of games that they have to play and the travel because the travel is just as impactful as the games itself because they're on airplanes and travel const traveling constantly. So just getting them to hold themselves together and being able to travel Keep these guys together. We're going to do that same thing with NFL. All this, all the work we've done in the off season, we're now going to reinforce that in season by going to meet these guys where they are, so we can keep them held together. That's that's interesting. I didn't know you traveled and, and kind of supported athletes mm -hmm. in that regard as well. It it seems very apparent to me that you are the jack of all trades uh, within the House of Athlete. You kind of do everything. Not only are you training and educating, but you're also creating all the different methodologies for which the other trainers are using for the athletes. So it seems like you do it all. And can I and not um, to interrupt you? I'm also we're also creating a certification 
um, that <clears throat> talks about or shows people the methodologies that we use here at House of Athlete that we'll do in-house as well as we'll release to people in the public who actually need to purchase it, sign up in and sit through the course. We're going to offer that to the public, public as well, and that's upcoming too. And I'm in the process of building that out actually for the last two years. So and that has video, it has practical videos, theory videos, it has all types of stuff, then PDFs to follow, study materials, event tests, you got to pass, quizzes, it's layered pretty deep. So, And, and what is that called? Do you have any, <laughs> I can't release it yet, or? but just you know, it's how for athletes, just, you know, we're putting out a certification. <laughs> but we will be releasing that okay. soon. And it's not just... Mm -hmm. It's not just for trainers, it's for, it's for general it's population. It's for trainers more than anything else. Because the science behind, some of the science within it is going to be relatively deep. It's for that coach that's fresh out of college, whether he's got a BS or a master's, that needs to understand how to take that information and utilize it in real time and, and actually make it and help translate it over to being successful. How do we take all that information we use out of the textbooks? And then what do we not privilege too because a lot of stuff that they study in the textbooks they don't even use because textbooks are outdated by the time they're printed so what's happening in real time is what these people really want to know and we're actually going to show you the science that we're using and how we analyze data and what data is actually useful to transfer it over to the lesson to help the athlete get better so we do expect you to let us know when you have a name and when you can actually release that and we will uh we'll let our listeners know as well um, I, I do want to ask you, you seem very motivated. You said you do an hour of research every single day over the course of your career, and it really was your 10-year plan to, just to get started. But do you find it difficult to motivate players, uh, or are they, for the most part, self-motivated? And that can be professional, collegiate, youth athletes. They can all differ uh, in, in that answer. But are they self-motivated, or do you feel that you're motivating players as part of your job? I think as a coach, understanding how to get that physical result or get that, uh, get that, get the best out of the athlete, you have to be understanding in regards to where that athlete is at that day. Um, it's a day by day approach because there are outside influences that impact the athlete, business, family, uh, family dynamic goes deeper. You got wife and children. Those are two different dynamics. People need to understand that. There's, there's two different things there. Um, I don't think people, I don't think young people understand that the difference is there. Um, the career itself, where they are within that contract. And we're talking about the pros and then we're talking about youth athletes, mom and dad, school, peer pressure, uh, achieving goals. Did they get in trouble in school? What, you know, did they just get yelled at in the car? Uh, you have to reset them when they walk in the door. And the only way you can reset them is to have a conversation. And that mental aspect of which how you approach that matters. So I do an assessment, physical and mental, before we even start the training because that's going to direct me in how I'm going to train that athlete that particular day. What I might have on paper that day may not matter based on what that athlete is. So that assessment, and that assessment, people talk about assessment. Yeah, assessment is critical. But assessment is not just one time and you create a program. Assessment is daily. And mentally, if that athlete is challenged because he's going to be challenged, we have to know how to reset them to get their mind back into a place that we can focus on creating the adaptation that's needed for that particular day. So sometimes they might need 30 minutes of conversation to get out of what they're dealing with. Sometimes it might take five. But helping them along the way and just being sometimes being a good listener is important. Early, early on in my career when I was young and I didn't have no advice to give, I was a great listener. Um, now, just life is ups and downs of life. The things that the, the failures, the failures don't define who you are. They're lessons. Um, I just posted something on Instagram of a kid falling off his bike and then getting up and dances. Because when you fail, it's an opportunity to get up and do it again and get better. You know, it's, it doesn't define us. Getting people to understand that at the beginning of the session or to reset them in their approach is everything from them from a mental standpoint. So I'd say just life itself, understanding how to get them to under, to to get to a point to where they can refocus, 
or meeting them where they are is kind of what I strive to do to build that consistency with the inner athlete from session to session. That kind of leads me into my next question, which is obviously the physical aspect of building athletes is kind of the forefront of what people perceive you to do. But how big, if not almost bigger, is the mental part of the game? Mental part is, mental mental part part of training. is huge. Um, the focus, understanding your why behind what you're doing, you know, that's the motivating factor. But then being able to be okay with failing. And because, I mean, you're, when you're competing at, when you're a cheat or trying to compete at the highest level, the, as you begin to climb that ladder of competitive sports, you're going to get points there where people are going to beat you. You're going to lose. You're not going to be successful every day. What do you do with that? How do you stay mentally, consi- how do you stay consistent in your approach? Um, it's... I would say one of the athletes that I'm working with now is he's an MLB guy. He's really good at this. He will, he can strike out three times in a game. And then the next game be four for four, three for four, because what he did yesterday, he's forgotten. Just remembering that failure doesn't define who you are. So if you stay locked in too long on one thing, they say paralysis by analysis. If you overanalyze something, you actually freeze up. You got to know it's a lesson behind it. Learn what you can learn from it and move past it. That's the key to it. And then, that will allow you to stay consistent because you're always striving to get better from these failures that occur. And a lot of the issues that most athletes have from that mental point, it's failure. That's what I'm talking about. They can't get past it. And they're so busy, can't get past. They're so busy not being able to get past it because they're too busy comparing. They're comparing them. They've been social as time with social media, but people are always posting the highlights of their life and the highlights of their day. So everybody really thinks that every day is supposed to be a highlight. Not when you're competing at the highest level. No, not, you know, it doesn't usually be for an example where you're three for, if you're three out of 10 times successful, which is a failure in any business math, you're, you're going to be a hall of famer. So being failure is a part of that process and taking that and using it for what it's worth will only help you be able to stay consistent and overcome obstacles where you don't paralyze yourself by staying locked in on one thing too long. Yeah, l- learning how to cope with failure is probably more important than anything else as you progress through high school and college and then into professional sports. That's life. Um, it, it's life. And social media, it does influence the way people perceive others to kind of live their life or play in their sports. And they see this like what you just said is a highlight if everybody – you know, everybody putting out their highlight films or everything's always great for the people because who's going to put out something that's negative about Don't themselves, right? Everybody's always putting out the, the, the best version of whatever they're doing that week, that month, that year uh, in their respective sport. They're always going to compile the best highlights, the best training clips, but there's a lot of different failures, setbacks, and, you know, people losing in their respective sports on a regular basis. And like you said, three out of 10 or a 300 hitter has a chance to be not only an all-star, but a hall of famer over the the span of their career. So it's interesting to hear you put it like that. Um, Just to wrap up here, um, I I know we've, we've kind of dove into all aspects of how you got started, your progression throughout your career, and then where you are currently with House of Athlete. But over your career, right, you've had a lot of time, I'm sure, to reflect on your journey as a trainer and also more than a trainer as a person, right? What, if anything, would you change or tell your younger self now, if anything, or would you leave it the way it is because you're saying, I needed to go through all those struggles to get to where I am today? That's a great question, and it's funny because I always think back to what I would go tell my younger self. I see... A lot of the, I see a lot of myself and a lot of the young trainers, you know, today, on, and it's in stages. So I can look at where a trainer at, is at at his current stage of his development and say I was at that stage at 30-something years old. I was at that stage at 20-something years old. So it helps me understand that, that, that trainer on where he's at at this stage of his career because I can identify with it because I was that guy and I went through those thoughts. So 
I don't know if I would change anything, but I would go back and tell my young self to be patient, not rush it. And it's not about the ending. It's more about who you become during the process. Because the information that I, I've been able to be exposed to, I'm so grateful for. And under Because I'm my brain wants to understand the aspects of how everything works. So through experience and research, I've had the chances of being able to just stumble upon things that and lessons that help me today that if I didn't go through those stumbles as a young man in the process of training, I wouldn't be able to see things and analyze it as fast as I do now. So enjoying that process more and understanding that's what's more important than the end goal that you begin out to achieve when you first start. I think that's something that everybody, not only in the training industry, but of all industries need to need to hear and, and understand is enjoy the process. Uh, you know, it's about who you become in the process versus trying to do everything in the first five years of your career, even though that's natural for most. And, and I think we're all at fault, including myself of that, but enjoying the process, learning, kind of absorbing all the different things, setbacks, accomplishments that you'll have over your career and, and keeping those things in perspective. So uh, Troy Jones of House of Athlete, I want to thank you for your time coming on Whole Team Meets podcast. I really enjoyed hearing your backstory and progression through training. Um, we will be letting our listeners know when that program does come out, uh, when you, you do uh, come out with the name of that athlete. But just want to say thank you again for your time. I Great appreciate to have it, you on man. The show. I enjoy it. I'm grateful for you guys having me.